Hey guys, welcome to the shop. Now this week is going to be a quick one. We're going to be sharpening this cutter here, which is a woodruff key cutter. We're going to be sharpening it on the cutter grinder, and I think that we're on the path to success. At least, I think we're on the right track. So let's go in the shop and get started. Alright guys, now today we're going to be sharpening a woodruff key cutter, or uh, yeah, that's what it is. It's a uh, straight toothed end mill that you would use to cut a keyway or a woodruff key in a shaft. Now, I've already done this once on film, but unfortunately my memory card decided to die. So we're going to do it again. But this time, it'll be with less mistakes because I've already done it once and I uh, know the game. So I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to show you the setup. Explain to you a little better what we're going to do. And we'll get started. All right, guys. Now, here's the one that I've already done. Now, this is, to be honest, my very first Woodruff Key, you know, cutter that I've sharpened and it turned out pretty good I had to do it twice to get it correct um, my angles were correct as far as my relief angles but um, I cylindrically grounded a little off and I didn't like that so I had to redo that one but now it's a functional end mill that's as sharp as a brand new one the one we're going to be sharpening today is not brand new it's probably uh, three times older than me and probably been beating around in somebody's toolbox for longer than I've been alive so we're going to clean it up. We're going to cylindrically grind it first to get all the edges back concentric with the shank. And then we're going to get uh, in here and dress up these cutting edges using a straight wheel. And there's a pretty neat method that you use to get your angles in with a straight wheel. My buddy Adam Booth sent me uh, some stickers and he sent me a book that explained to me the method that you use to put those relief angles in. And that had been, you know, stumping me for a while for at least you know two weeks how do you set the proper finger height well I figured it out thanks to Adam and that book and I'm gonna show you how I done it so I'm gonna clean this up and we'll get started all right here's one mistake that I made on the first one and that's not making sure that uh, I was lined up you know my centers were lined up with the travel of the table and I just got an indicator you know with my the end mill between centers here running it back and forth and over that distance right now I'm a half a thousandth low so it's tilted this way a little bit so with this you know machine I can tilt the table and just bring it into alignment I'm good on the top as far as the height but uh, you know side to side it uh, if you take these fixtures off you got to indicate them all back in and uh, the way you do it is just by manipulating uh, these handles doesn't take much you just tighten it back down and run back and forth until well that's almost perfect right there bring you and show you this is a tense indicator and move the table back and forth. So that's what I didn't do on the on the first one and I had to redo it. But no big deal. You know, you learn these things as you go. Alright, doesn't know. This is my powered work head. It's another three phase motor, so I'm gonna be running it off of my rotary phase converter uh, because I don't think it's wise to run, you know, two motors off the same variable frequency drive. So We'll be running this. This is what's going to power it and turn it for, you know, uh, an attachment. So it, to drive it, I'm going to be using just a standard band clamp. And on these centers, I'm going to be using some white lead. Now, this was given to me by Stan from Bar Z. Um, I put it in. He sent it to several people, and he sent it in a little uh, a syringe. I uh, I put mine in a glass jar because the stuff likes to separate and uh, this just keeps it from, uh, you know, keep, makes it easy to stir and easier to handle. This stuff's really toxic too, so I just take a little piece of rag and throw it immediately away after I wipe this stuff off. I don't uh, wipe it on my normal rags because then it contaminates everything. 
So we've now lubed our centers. We've got a dog driver and I'm going to blue up these teeth with some dicum so I can see where I'm grinding. Um, we're going to blue each one. That way we know when to stop and we can tell where our wheel's hitting. Otherwise, you know, you're, it can be hard to tell. So we'll let that dry. We'll get our belt system over on this pulley. We'll get our rotary phase converter fired up and then we'll cylindrically grind this thing. Vacuum system going. Uh, got our power head going. Get our wheel going. I'd like to run this wheel the other way, but this arbor that's on it, the only safe way to run it is you know, counterclockwise. So then come in and touch off. There we go. I'm just going to work this back and forth until I get it cleaned up. The blue will tell me. When I you know, get this thing true all the way around, that's all I want to do. And if we were trying to get this to a specific size, we would OD grind it just like we're doing to the, you know a certain size. But I don't think it's critical on this type of cutter really, unless you're in a factory where you know your machines are set up to run. You know, specific size cutters. All right. We've got it cleaned up all the way to the back of the land. So I think we're good to go. tooth here that's chipped, but I'm not going to try to, you know, grind all these down to uh, you know, just to make up for that one little tooth. Um, it's just, you know, we're just going through the motions, trial and error here. Um, I think this will work. Now we'll glue these back up, we'll flip this around, and then we'll set up our finger system and put our cutting edges on it. But first, my wife and kids want to go over and look at the garden, so uh, let's take a quick break, run over and check it out, and we'll come back and sharpen this guy. Got a uh, storm rolling in. Last week we dealt with wind blowing this corn down, and uh, it was it was about 75% of it. it. Got blowed almost completely over. My dad had to come out here and you know stand it all back up. He goes through the same thing every year. We're on top of a hill up here, you know, at my parents' place. Let's go down here before it rains and look at the other garden, the smaller one. spoke too soon that storm come through and blow it down again you know that's a good day's work to straighten this stuff up and if you don't straighten it up it'll just crook and then grow up and then you can't even walk through the rows to to work it so it's got to be stood back up what are you doing buddy well see how big this has gotten within a week this corn it grows fast luckily this is uh, pretty small so it didn't hurt at the wind but that was a pretty strong storm that just blew through. I need to get in here and work this garden and get these weeds out of it. Well, that's really unfortunate to, you know, about the garden. You know, it's not the first time this year it's happened, so you know, when you garden, it's you're at the mercy of the weather, really. And uh, just gonna have to stand it back up. You know, that's all we can do. And wind blows around my parents' house, it blows really hard. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that's not good. So, what we have to do is set the, this is our finger, and it will hold our cutting tooth at the proper height to a grind, you know, 
the relief angle that we want on it. This finger right now is set exactly to the same center height as these two centers and the center of the wheel. Now we'll change because this is a round wheel and we're grinding on the face of it, it's a radius. So whether we raise or lower this wheel, it will change the relationship between this cutter and the wheel and that radius and give us the relief angle. There is a formula for that and in the book that Adam gave me, it has that formula in it. Now, you know, I went two weeks, you know, not, uh, not knowing that and uh, knowing that there was something out there but I you know didn't have anything to you know refer to but that book was a great gift and it uh, turned me on to the information that I needed so I really appreciate that so I'm gonna get set up here and I'll bring you back and I'll show you the setup a little in a little more detail and we'll put these cutting edges on it and we'll take it to the mill and see if it cuts all right, now on these two pages are information that I had a hard time finding, but uh, I'm glad Adam sent me this book because it's right here. I mean, all the information that I need to set my finger height, and it varies between a cup wheel and a straight wheel. On a cup wheel, you're grinding on just a flat face, but on a straight wheel, you're, grind, you're grinding on a radius, and you take that radius, uh, you take advantage of that radius in order to get your relief ground on your cutter. And it's pretty simple. You bring the centers of the wheel and the centers of the work into the same plane, which we've done. These centers are exactly the same as the center height of the wheel. Two, fasten the tooth rest to the table of the machine and adjust the tooth rest to the same height as the centers of the work using a height gauge. So I just took this over on the surface plate. I know my height from my table to my centers and set it that way. And three, raise or lower, depending upon the rotation of the wheel, the work head to the proper distance by means of the graduated hand wheel, which we're not going to use that. We're going to use a dial indicator. The distance to raise or lower the wheel head when using a straight wheel, like we're using, may be calculated as followed. So multiply the clearance angle in degrees by the diameter of the wheel in inches. Okay, I want seven degrees and my wheel happens to be 6.848 inches. So multiply by 6.848 and then multiply that by a constant which is 0.0087 and that gives me 417 thousandths of an inch that I have to, in this situation, raise my wheel in order to get seven degrees of clearance behind the cutting edge. So we're gonna raise this up and then we're gonna blue these and cut it. All right, they're mag base off the table now. I'm just gonna raise this 416 thousandths. One, two, three, 4, 10, 15, and 16. Now we're going to blue these teeth and grind them in. I have learned a lot about this machine in a short amount of time, but uh, this is a machine that takes you know, a skilled operator with several different skill sets that I don't necessarily have yet. So, you know, it's a complicated machine to learn, I'll say that because there's so many things, so many ways to, to mess up. I mean, for one, you gotta be good at grinding, you know, and then setting up angles and understanding all this relief angles, cutter geometry and nomenclature and, you know, loads of other things. So it's tough, but uh, I think anybody could do it with a little bit of practice. That's all, you know, all I'm doing. All right, now, this finger's down here holding on this tooth. This wheel is going to be rotating this way. So it's going to want to pick that tooth up off of that tooth rest, and I don't want that to happen. So I have to hold this cutter and traverse back and forth. Then I'll index to the next tooth and do the same thing. And I'm just going to come in slow, bring this slow into the wheel, and I'm going to be watching my blue working right up to the edge. If I would have cylindrically ground this to a specific OD, I wouldn't want to go past, really all I want to do is just barely kiss the end of that uh, uh, blue 
just remove it really because I'm only putting one one land in this thing that way I don't reduce the outside diameter so I've got a blue line here or a black line here and all that'll do is tell me when I make it all the way around so we'll bring it in the wheel running bring it in a touch off and start working our way around and working in Feed in just till I touch. Alright, I got touch. Yep. I'm gonna work my way around and then keep working it in until I get the uh, edge that I want. Takes, uh, got to concentrate. All right, so we've already been around once. It happens pretty quick. Bring it in and we'll start all over. We'll just feed in a little and do it again. Back at the beginning, let me bring you in a little closer and get you a better look at these teeth. So we just got a little blue line left. We're just working up to that line. All I'm doing. Now, I don't have a lot of experience doing this, so I don't know, if, you know what we're doing is ideal. But what we're doing works. You know, it does work earlier. How long these third will last, you know, the only time will tell. And we'll refine our uh, method as we go. This is where I'm at right now. So. I'm going to bring these in, just to kiss that edge, and then we're going to take it over the middle and try it. There it is. I mean, that is uh, pretty good, if you ask me. Um, you know, without a way to really measure these relief angles, we're in a way guessing. But uh, even the book says that, uh, you know, a person that grinds these will keep a notebook. They'll uh, write down what works, what doesn't, what cutters seem to last longer, uh, you know, under, you know, what conditions they were ground. And, you know, keeping a log book is what they suggest. You know, because a lot of this is a uh, you know operator experience. There's that tooth that was chipped, but the rest of them turned out pretty good. Finish is decent. That's uh, that wheel is a, a 60k. So we were using a 60j. This one is a 60k. So I think that would be a little softer. But uh, we can take this over to the mill and. Uh, give it a shot. You know, when you're adjusting uh, the height of the wheel, or when you're using a cup wheel versus a straight wheel, the only thing that changes as far as getting these angles in is on a cup wheel you don't adjust the height of the wheel because that plane doesn't change. You're grinding on the face of that wheel. You adjust the finger height to change the, to just twist the cutter in one direction or another in relation to the flat of that wheel. So, that's all it's about, you know. Um, one thing you got to be able to do for sure is see well, because if you can't see well, you won't be able to grind well. This is, you know, a whole new world for me. So let's take this over to the milling machine and put it in there and cut some steel with it. All right, guys. Now I got to thinking. You know, every end mill I put in this thing seems like it runs out. And uh, let me bring you in and show you. 
because it does. Uh, this spindle's at least got a thousand run out in it. Uh, no matter how I take that end mill in or put it out, it, it doesn't seem to make much difference. It's still uh, got at least a thousandth run out, sometimes more. So not much more, but you know, a little more, little maybe a hair less. So this spindle is, you know, this machine is destined to become a drill press. And by the time you put enough money in this thing to really fix it, given the tableware and stuff on it, you could have bought a use a decent used machine that doesn't have all these problems and won't require six months of rebuild time. So I blew the teeth on this cutter. That way we can uh, see if we're rubbing behind the cutting edge. Uh, it'll tell us a little bit. We got a chunk of mild steel in here, so we're going to come in. We're going to take. We're not going to baby this thing. I mean, it's going to do or die. We're going to take a 50,000 steep cut and run across this and see how it acts. Oh, wrong way. We're going to come in and touch off. A little more than a touch, but whatever. Dial in 50 thousandths. width of the cutter and I'm going to feed across. Actually it feels like it cuts good. It doesn't sound great but that's the meal. This book here says, you know, for low carbon steels, anywhere from five to seven degrees, and for high carbon steels, if you're going to be machining those with a cutter, you should put in three to five degrees. We went with seven just to be safe, just to make sure we had, you know, adequate uh, clearance. This is just proof of concept right now. We can refine it, like I said, you know, as we go. But, uh, I mean, I think that that looks really good. It's not rubbing at all and uh, it's still really sharp. We only took two cuts with it but still you know if it was going to break down you know uh, like some of the others a few others that I've done they start to break down and rub you know and you can tell immediately that it's just not going to work out. So let me get you in a little closer and get you a good shot at these edges. Well guys, I'd say I'm pretty happy with the results uh, on the cutter we ground. Um, our clearance angles are at least adequate. We know that. We still can't measure them. Um, I need to get the, so I think it's a 459. One of my viewers uh, sent me a link to uh, the, you know, the tool that's used to measure these clearance angles. So in a way we're still guessing, but uh, we're not, if that makes any sense. I've got tons of Woodruff key cutters. Some of them, all, basically all of them are regrinds. But uh, the ones that are, you know, coated in their gel coat or whatever you want to call it are in good shape. But the ones, you know, even though these don't look like they've been used since they've been reground, they've been beat around in a toolbox for, you know, 
probably decades. I bought these in a box of stuff when I got the big shaper, so I've had them for quite some time. And uh, they all need touched up, so I'm going to do that. I still got a lot to learn on that machine. I don't think anybody would argue that that is a complicated machine. And it, so many different skill sets are involved with that machine. Grinding, you know, measuring, uh, you know, just all the different setups. Because there's so many ways, you know, you can set that machine up to do the same operation. And finding the right one, you know, to get good results is tough. So, still a long way to go. I'm pretty confident that I can do fluted. Uh, edges. Um, I've tried a couple of them. Here's one here that I've done. It's just a Woodruff key with a uh, fluted tooth. Or a helical tooth. A fluted tooth. A helical cutting edge. Adam gave me the book. It is a Norton Abrasives a handbook on tool room grinding and in this book was some great information it really took me from guessing to actually uh, what I believe is doing it somewhat correctly yeah. my results at least you know tell me that I'm doing it you know at least partially correct anyway so still a lot to learn he sent me some uh, stickers my wife already scavenged a couple of them so uh, there I've got one on the fridge he sent me a magnet which was nice one of these in a magnet form and then uh, some of his other stickers that uh, I didn't have in a A-bomb swag envelope. So thanks, Adam. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, that really is a great book. I've already read it three times cover to cover. So still a lot to learn. Uh, and I think next I'm going to start uh, focusing on the ends of your standard end mills. That's going to be kind of tough because you're working with really close tolerances, you know, trying to grind the end of an end mill really close quarters let's just say that and all it takes is one little slip and you're you're in mill you start all over so i really appreciate you guys watching um, all my old subscribers and all my new ones all my patrons and just all my viewers in general um, i really appreciate you guys so if you haven't subscribed to the channel make sure to click on the little guy up here hit the bell for notifications and as always i'll see you next time <music>